Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose with Pose Acoustics and in this video I'm going to answer a question that I, I think in order to answer I need to start with uh, a statement. <laughs> all theaters, I said this before but I'm going to say it again, all theaters are a combination of compromises. In fact, I think what separates good engineers from bad engineers is how they make those compromises and recognizing where they're making them. I've heard people refer to themselves as uncompromising and I've heard people say that the theaters that they build um, are uncompromising. And I think that's honestly disingenuous. Um, you can't build a uncompromising theater. There are always compromises. What I think you're doing is balancing the compromises to get the best performance that you can, given the situation you have. So let me start with this one. So the question is from Bougie Bollocks. And he says, hi, Matthew. Great channel. Thank you. And I appreciate it. Question, in your cinema, how have you maintained the room within a room sound isolation, but with in-wall speakers? Do these not compromise the wall? Have you had to make a third room within a room? So it's a good question. I actually think I've answered this before, um, but I'm going to give a, a more succinct answer uh, than I, well, probably won't be succinct, but I'll do my best on uh, how this works. So the idea of a room within a room conceptually, and it's actually done this way sometimes, would be like building a bunker. So imagine you create a concrete six-sided bunker. So you've got the four walls, the floor, and the ceiling. Six-sided bunker, the size of the room you're going to use. And then it sits inside of a room that for the sake of argument, this, this was paid I believe in pounds or euros, I can't, I should know this, I'm sorry, but it's not U.S. currency, so I'm going to use meters for a minute. We're going to say that the larger room is half a meter larger than the inner room, so there's that, there's that much space around it. <clears throat> and then it sits on a bunch of springs with a natural resonance frequency below the isolation frequencies needed, so we'll say 3-4 hertz, something like that. That would be a true room within a room, and almost nobody does that. It's done in studios, rarely but sometimes, and it's done in uh, test labs, frequently. It is not done in residence. So think about what that would mean. It would mean that you start by building a basically decoupled floor that sits on springs. On top of the decoupled floor, you then sit all of your four walls, and then attached to those walls is your ceiling, which is all sitting in a manner that is fully untouching of an outer shell of walls and ceiling. So there's another set of walls and ceiling that you're sitting within, basically. It may not be drywall, but the point is that there's, there's wood structure there. That's a room within a room done in, in a typical, let's say, timber type construction. If it was concrete, similar concept. So imagine you've got a room, it's already got an outer shell, it's already got an, a floor, and it's already got some sort of ceiling to it. And inside of that, you put another floor on springs, and then you build on top of that your walls and a new ceiling. What's the more common way that it's done, which is what was done here, is you build your outer shell walls either as a extra set of stud walls separate from the outer shell ones. You have an inner shell set of stud walls which sit on isolators. So they themselves are decoupled from the floor. The footer is decoupled and the header is decoupled from the floor and ceiling. Attached to that is drywall. Sometimes, like in my room, you also have hush frame decouplers which just further adds more decoupling of the inner shell itself which is that drywall material. The floor is decoupled it's its own thing. Now sometimes you'll put the studs on top of the floor, sometimes you don't. I did not. I actually have the inner floor as a fully separate structure from the walls and ceiling. So my floor just floats in the room. And that sits on springs. Um, it's silicone springs, so the natural frequency of silicone with mass like this typically is in the neighborhood of around 7 or 8 hertz. If I had used rubber blocks, it would probably be 20 to 30 hertz. So if anyone wonders why I don't use rubber, there's your answer. And then the ceiling sits on a hush, decoupled hush frame system as well. So the ceiling basically is kind of floating too. But it's not physically attached to the side walls and the floor in any way, shape, or form. Basically, I have a front wall, a rear wall, and two side walls, which each individually are decoupled from each other because of how the room was built. They, the, the drywall, basically, its only attachment to the other drywall is uh, caulk, acoustic caulk. And then for the ceiling, it's the same thing. There's no attachment of the ceiling to the sidewalls. It's just kind of floating there, and it's caulked, and then my floor. 
So that, that's my room. That's To me, that's different than room within a room, but it's conceptually exactly the same thing because the concept is sound that's inside the room is hitting these boundaries and there is no direct path for the sound to then transfer to the outside boundaries. That's why you do the room within a room. And that's what this room does. Um, and it is consistent with how we typically do this type of stuff. So that's my room. So when I cut a hole in the wall, yes, I penetrated my shell. And yes, that lets sound out. But think about it. If you take your wall, in my case, it's a couple layers of drywall, uh, and you cover it with a plate of metal, of damped metal, that has the same STC rating as the couple layers of drywall does because it's relatively similar mass, then have I actually penetrated it in a meaningful way? And I would argue, not really. I mean, that's kind of like putting a door, like a sound rated door on the wall, right? You know, it's, yes, you've put a big hole in it in order to walk in and out of the room, but the hole is covered by something that's designed to block, as, let's say, almost as much sound as the wall did already. So I'll tell you from a number standpoint, I measured in the low 60s for the STC rating for the wall behind me. So what that meant was when you measure sound in the room and you measure sound on the other side of that wall and my office that's there, um, the STC number was 62 or 63, something like that. And the rating for a double stud wall like this should be around 65 to 70, I would say. I've seen higher numbers. I don't think they're accurate, to be honest with you. There's various reasons why I don't trust those. Um, now, there's numerous compromises. I mean, that wall is like a bad wall, too. So of all the compromises, there are subwoofers in the wall. And I'm not totally convinced that the method we used actually did a great job of fully covering everything. There's actually some, like, holes into the wall that, while well, we kind of caulked them up and put some mass around them, it was not ideal. Probably wouldn't, I would not do that in a client house, and after doing it here to see if it was a way to make it work, I would do it differently next time. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is there's the speakers in the wall. So the other issue besides the plate over it, like I said, is that the speaker itself radiates sound through the plate that can get out. And that's probably the concern that most of you would have. So in the room, I don't believe there's a significant compromise caused by the speakers where sound gets through them. Because if you think about it, the sound now has to go through the front baffle and speaker drivers into the enclosure and then through the damped aluminum panels that are on the back of it. And actually on those, there's uh, some aluminum and bitumen material around it that's designed to add some extra damping and a little bit of extra isolation. Wouldn't shock me if that raised the STC rating a little bit. I mean, the walls themselves, the drywall, if you think about it from a plate standpoint, two layers of 5 8 inch drywall is like high 30s, low 40s, something like that, just as a plate based on mass. Um, maybe that's not even right, actually, now that I say that. I think two layers of 5 8 drywall is actually in the mid-30s. I think I'm exaggerating that number. That's pretty close to what the damped aluminum would be on its own. So, and that's just the one layer. I mean, you've got other materials and layers and insulation and everything in this. So I don't know that that compromised things much. Then, like I said, you do have sound radiating out the back of it. So again, like not a lot of sound radiates out the back of a speaker. Pretty much no high frequencies are gonna, it's gonna only be the lower frequencies. And uh, the design of the enclosure, it's an airtight enclosure. So everything below the resonant frequency of the system is going to be defined by the fact that it's a pressure vessel. So very little, very low frequencies will get out. Um, at mid-high frequencies, like I said, the high frequencies don't get out. There are some mid-range frequencies that get out. But I think that when you think about what we've got going on here, it's not a huge compromise. It's not nothing, but it's not a huge compromise. And it's no different than when people take, and I mean, this is common. You see this even on the forums. People will put in ceiling speakers or in-wall speakers, and they build a box in the wall for the speaker to go into. They've decoupled the box. How is that different from what I did? I mean, I can, if, if the answer is you think that three-quarter inch MDF is better than aluminum, it's not. If the answer is you think that, uh, you know, I've seen people do like sandwiches of drywall and plywood or, or whatever to... Again, none of that is better than what I did. It's about the same or worse. So <clears throat> I would argue that this is in line with th those compromises, which are in themselves a little bit compromised. But having done this so many times now, I've really come to the same conclusion every time. We sometimes get too hung up on little details and small compromises, and you kind of miss the forest for the trees. You 
put so much effort into not losing a single point of isolation, and then you make the system not really meet your needs. And I don't think that that's a good idea. So in my case, I wanted the speakers to be as low profile and effectively invisible as possible in the room. I didn't want to see them. I didn't want boxes on stands on the wall hanging out. I don't like that look. Uh, it does have sound performance compromises compared to what I did. And so really what I wanted to do was what I did do. And that was to create a system that is ultimately meeting my aesthetic needs, meeting my sound quality needs, and is acceptably good for sound isolation. And I think that I've achieved that goal. I will say this, subjectively, you can hear in the office when a movie is playing in here. It's not loud. Part of the problem is we've set up the desks so that your chair is up against the same wall that's the office wall, the, the theater wall. So whatever sound gets through, even if it dissipates pretty rapidly as you get farther into the office, like if you get into the office and you walk into, it's a small office, but if you walk towards the window side, the outside wall, you can't really hear much. Bass you can hear a little bit, but that's to be expected. You can't hear voices or anything. If you then move right up against the wall so that your ear is within, let's say, six inches to a foot, a uh, quarter to half a meter, something like that maybe. I know that's not six inches to a foot, but make your life easier. Um, you can hear it a little bit, and you could recognize voices. Maybe not enough to tell exactly what they're saying, but you could tell somebody's talking. It's muffled. So my wife, who works in there at night, if I put a movie on really loud, she'll sometimes send messages like, you know, Jesus Christ, what is this? Apologize for the saying that, but you get my point. Like, it's like overwhelming to her how loud it is. Except that I've gone in there surprised that she could hear it, only to say it's not loud at all. It's, here's the issue that's going on. The office is basically almost as quiet as the theater because we, in order to build the theater the way we did, we actually had to continue that throughout the entire upstairs, which is only the office and theater. So the office actually has a floating floor too. It's a separate floating floor from this one, but we needed to maintain the same height so that the doors could all have like a flat entryway. Um, the drywall, so there's only one partition wall and it's two layers of drywall and it's insulated, right? The windows are, then the outer part is two by eight construction. Now there's no decouplers in there, but there is five eighths inch type X drywall. And on the outside, there's a mixture of concrete board and plywood. So it's got a pretty heavy duty shell. It's insulated fully. And then it's got really, really sound isolated windows because hurricane rated windows have laminated glass and they're double. Uh, so it's a laminated glass layer and then a second layer of glass. So the uh, sound inside outside sound rating of those windows is way higher than normal windows. So that office is really quiet. The HVAC too. I mean, the same upgrades we did here, we just carried in there because it was like, well, there's a couple of vents here, a couple of vents there. We just used the same ducting, just made it easier for everything. So the office is extremely quiet for a non-specially built room. And uh, as a result of it being a very quiet room, while it's not quite as quiet as this room, it is quiet enough that whatever you hear in there just sounds louder than it really is because from a relative standpoint, it is. You know, like this would probably not be audible in most people's houses, the sound that gets through that wall, but it is in my house. Um, especially at night when there's, you know, no traffic outside, no, nobody working, etc. So my point of all this is, no, I, I mean, I just basically allowed for the compromise. I think it's a very minor compromise. The test data that I've collected seems to suggest it's a very minor compromise, if any at all. Um, just as an example, I can turn the speakers off and do the testing, and I get basically the exact same result as if I do the testing using those speakers. Um, the bigger compromise in my room actually is not those, it's the door. I have an STC rated you know, over three, four thousand dollar door, and it is the by far weakest link in that wall right there. And the only saving grace there is that that on the other side of that wall is a hallway and staircase. There's nothing else there. And then when you go to the bottom of it, you have to pass through a little passageway into our kitchen, and there's a door between those two. If you close that door, you can no longer hear anything in the rest of the house from the theater. Pretty much dead silence. So. So again, it's like a balancing of compromises here, if you will. I, I would like that door to be better. It would have cost me $6,000 plus 
and the installation would have been more complicated to go better. Better would have been only five points better. If I wanted to go even better than that, if I wanted an STC rated door that equaled the STC rating of the walls, that would have been about $12,000. So I would have had a $12,000 door and I'm sure the installation would have been even more complicated yet. Like at some point, this just gets silly. So you have to kind of stop yourself and say, you know, this is gonna be good enough, I'll be happy with it. And in my case, the goal was very low noise floor, able to watch movies at reference levels without bothering anybody. And that is absolutely been achieved here. You, when I watch movies at reference levels, my kids can sleep downstairs, my wife can watch TV or read a book or sleep herself uh, downstairs without this waking her up. She can work in the office. I do have to turn it down, but primarily that's because base vibrations still transfer through and it shakes that room and she doesn't really like that. Having said that, I do it anyway sometimes because I just want to and she happens to be working really late and it's not the end of the world. And again, when you go in there, it's pretty faint. She's just noise sensitive. So I had to do this in the first place. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd have to do a whole nother video, I think, to really get into the, like, what would it take to build a truly soundproof room, right? And it, obviously that's technically impossible, but like, let's just say we establish that soundproof doesn't mean all sound is blo blocked, but all sound that could be heard is blocked. Meaning that when you produce the maximum SPL that a movie's gonna produce in, in this room, what exists at a certain distance on the other side of the wall equals either the noise floor or zero dB or something like that. And probably the noise floor would be a better number to use. You'd have to have walls that have somewhere between like an STC 80 and STC 100 rating. These would be theoretical walls. No such walls really exist. 80 to 85 people have built. Much past that, you're looking into kind of made up nonsense that probably theoretically could be done, but would be hard. And I think you'd be looking at like a ridiculously complex and expensive build. It would be very difficult to do that. Um, I have heard of a, I think it's called Galaxy Studios that was done by Wilfred who did RO3D. So I guess he holds the world record in his studio for having the highest sound isolation at over 100 dB. So we'll just say that that equals STC 100. It's a concrete bunker on springs. I think that's what you'd have to build for a theater. That was, I mean, that would have been way out of budget for me. I think a concrete bunker, you know, to actually have this room built as a concrete shell I can only assume we'd be looking in the neighborhood of a quarter million dollars of construction costs for that. So, all right, hopefully this video was helpful. I rambled a little bit, sorry. Thanks for watching and we'll keep answering these questions.